Greg Williams, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Why, thank you very much, Howie. Appreciate the re-invitation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got I got a lot to ask you because, uh, okay. and, and it was uh, it was um, triggered by a, a LinkedIn article you wrote. We're we're part of a, a networking group together, and there's been a lot of conversation about imposter syndrome. And and you wrote about imposter syndrome in negotiation, and it was a, a sort of a short truncated article with just a few thoughts. Um, and I got triggered by it, and I you know, I know we we had a couple an email exchange back and forth, and you graciously agreed to to come and talk and help help me think through um, this. And I think it's not just about negotiation, but uh, about sort of winning in general. And the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the dynamic about winning as an individual and then also as part of, of a society and having, you know, certain assets and advantages and privileges when you're playing the game in the first place. So um, I really wanted to you know, dive into that with you because I could see that I had a lot of emotional reactions that weren't necessarily based on reality, fact, or um, or or outcomes that I want. Um, so let's. Uh, so before we get into that, why don't you sort of re reintroduce yourself, so so the the audience has a, a frame of reference for who you are and where you come from. Sure. Um, my name is, as you said earlier, Greg Williams. My moniker is the master negotiator and body language expert. I teach others how to negotiate and read body language throughout the world in corporate environments government environment, private network uh, arenas, and I speak from the platform in many different seminars and virtually. And how we, if we can really just jump right into this, I'll tell you, imposter syndrome is real. Now, it's also real from the perspective of how people look at whatever they term an imposter. Uh, well, let, well, let me just ask you right up front. Give your definition of what imposter syndrome is. So I would say it's a, a thought process or a mental construct that arises when you are facing a challenge that you can objectively meet. And some part of you is saying, you can't do this. Who do you think you are? You've been lucky. You've been fooling people. You've been fooling yourself. Now you're going to get found out for the fraud that you are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and that and that 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 thought process then um, infiltrates your mind so that it's taking up RAM. Like before we started this conversation, you were closing windows because you said your your computer froze during a webinar. And like this to me is like a bunch of windows open in your mind that even if you're trying to deny it or overcome it or ignore it, they're still they're still sapping your mental RAM. And degrading your performance. Very good. I, I like the analogy between the computer windows being open and closing some of the resources needed in order to focus the resources upon this particular interaction that you and I ha are having and that of how we need to close the windows of our mind from a negativity perspective at points in time in order to focus more upon whatever we are dealing with. Now, here's, here's the reason I posed that question also. Depending upon the environment in which people have grown up, some people consider those that have imposter syndrome as people that are acting outside of whatever their normal environment happens to be. And mm. I wanted to set the groundwork such that people understand exactly from what perspective you and I are having our conversation about it. Imposter syndrome is, as I stated a moment ago, real. And sometimes individuals that think they are not worthy of, good enough uh, to be in a particular situation will act a certain way in a negotiation, especially dependent upon and based on their mindset. Their mindset becomes their, call it either worst enemy or something that prevents them from progressing the negotiation to the point that they might have been able to do so otherwise. In uh, talking with a lot of, let's say, smaller business owners, 
when negotiating with larger entities, mm -hmm. that smaller business owner wants to make sure that he or she can get the best deal that they seek, but because they have this thought process that says, I can't negotiate against a Microsoft. I can't negotiate against an IBM because they have many more resources. That individual is already placing themselves at a disadvantage. The imposter syndrome is preventing them from talking about the value proposition that they have per what that IBM, what that Microsoft actually sees in them. And it's something that people have to be mindful of. Uh, you and I also, in our exchange, had the, let's say, discussion about the fact that sometimes individuals will take advantage of other individuals simply because they know that person may possess thoughts uh, about not being aggressive enough, uh, be it whatever that happens to be per the situation they're experiencing, and how people can sit back, relax, and interact with one another as opposed to somebody trying to take advantage of them. So there's a whole realm that we can frame this under for sure, but I'll let you take the lead on that. Uh -huh. Well, yeah, there's a lot to unpack mm -hmm. in what you've just said. It seems to me like there, there might be a little bit of a difference between me thinking, oh, I'm a small business and I can't, I don't have the resources to go up against Microsoft versus I am not worthy to be in the room because of who I am, right? Like the, the it's, I think it'd be easier to talk someone into negotiating well when you say like, why is Microsoft in the room with you? Like, what do they want, right? As opposed to who let you in? And you talked about like being, you can, I can, you know, imposter syndrome is situational, right? Like there's certain places where I'll yes. go where all of a sudden I'll see other people and I'll go, oh my God, they all have, you know, second homes and they're all, you know, they're all talking about summer in the Hamptons or going to Napa Valley and, and I don't have that. So there's, you know, like I, I'm, I'm not of this ilk. Definitely so. So in that particular situation, and I'm glad you brought it up, does the second home matter that much per you having imposter syndrome, thinking you're not good enough? That's something that I would suggest people question because we all have value. And the fact that we all have value means in certain environments, you just have to increase your perspective that others have of you per the value you bring into a situation. And okay, you won't be accepted by every group, every one, every time. But then again, you have to ask yourself, from my perspective, to what degree does it matter? To what degree should you alter your perspective to fit in as opposed to understanding what mindset you have that you can use to better promote your well-being. That, that's my perspective. And, and so thus, the way one deals with imposter syndrome when thinking they're not good enough really comes down for me to changing the mindset that one has. Mm -hmm. So I want to get into what the, like, what the tools are that you, that you employ and teach people. But it seems, it seems like what you said just now about we, we all have value. Um, brings to my like what I what I'm thinking is when I'm at my best, I believe that all human beings have equal inherent value, that you're maybe smarter than me or bit more athletic or richer or better looking or more famous or whatever. But though and, and there's a real those can be real, like you can be better than me at X or have more Y than me. But that doesn't change the fundamental calculus that we are all equally valuable just because we're human beings. Right? And, and, there, and therefore, the thought that, oh, that person is richer than me or more famous or more successful or has a bestseller or is a movie star is a fundamental error that probably goes way back in our psychology to like early childhood, possibly. Right. And yet, and you're teaching like 
how how to outthink or how to how to think your way around that or so if, you know so one of the questions is like is it apples and oranges like are you teaching thinking tools around what's basically a psychological problem and i'm i'm curious for you you know to hear kind of your story um personally as in addition to the the tools and techniques well you know it, it's interesting too i i love the way that you framed that um, perspective. I really do, because truth be known, Howie, I never really considered myself as teaching the mindset from a from an imposter syndrome perspective. Uh, when I teach negotiation strategies, what I talk about is ways to gain leverage in the negotiation. So going back to the example that we spoke of a moment ago with small business owners negotiating against a larger entity, if you first of all understand why they even have you in the room or better yet mindset shift why they are in the room with you different way to look at it you then mm. think of the way i teach uh, negotiation strategies what is it that they need from you why are they talking to you to whom else are they speaking what are they going to do if they can't get what they need from you or another source quickly? And when you start combining all of those thought processes together, you can th start to assess to what degree you have value in that particular situation. That's what I teach. Okay. Once you made that assessment, how do you embolden your perspective that they have of your value? And you do that by then going out and gaining leverage. So hypothetically, and we've used IBM and Microsoft already. So let's say hypothetically, Microsoft and um, IBM happens to be negotiating for one particular aspect that you and a few other vendors can supply. Well, right away, you know, you have leverage because you know, you have these two Goliath uh, Goliaths fighting against one another, trying to position themselves such that they get what they need from you or a few other resources. One thing that you and those other resources could do is to combine your entities together such that, okay, look, you can get it from us. So I talk about how to use leverage to increase one's perspective of value, number one, and in so doing, increase the value perspective one has of themselves, be it a large entity or a single individual. Mm. So in, in some of the negotiations I've been involved in, um, one of the things that I can feel very strongly as like, like a, a gut, a body feeling mm. is a fear of the deal falling apart. And so in my mind, anything I do, a counter offer, or a rejection or a hesitation or an objection to a point they're making all feels like life or death risky. Mm. Cause in that, in that moment, the deal in front of me somehow takes on the, like the proxy of my entire life, even though it's not, even though it's a negotiation for a car or, uh, a, you know, uh, how much I'm going to get paid for a project. It's like there's part of me that I can feel that, like that all of your words make sense and they're terrifying. <laughs> well, you know, how, what, how do you how do you help people think about? That? Well, I was going to say once again, and, and you hit upon the exact key factor that one always had to be mindful of before entering into a negotiation. And, and it is your mindset. What type of mindset will you take into that negotiation? And the reason I said the type of mindset you will take into that negotiation is because we all have different perspectives about different environments in which we participate. So the question I would then suggest you consider, first of all, is number one, reality says, if you don't get that car, life will continue for you. It is not the end all. And recognize and embrace that as a realism. It, it, the world is not going to crumble for you simply because you don't get that car, you can go to other sources to obtain a vehicle. Calm yourself with that thought process is what I would suggest, number one. Number two, before you enter into the environment, I suggest that people have 
mock negotiations. They have people on the opposite side and they interact with those individuals as though they were in the real negotiation in which they will participate later. What that does is help to allay some of the fears, some of the negativity that one will have before entering into the negotiation. And they also get a chance to develop strategies that they can use, what if type of uh, scenarios, if they encounter such. And the other aspect is you should always plan how that particular negotiation will occur, understand what you will do at certain mile markers. So for example, if you and the, you know what the maximum price that you're going to set for the car, uh, as far as what you are willing to pay for it. Now this may sound contrary, but you should also know what it is that you are not willing to go below a price point. And people go, wait a minute. Um, you're telling me if I'm willing to spend $30,000 for the car and instead the dealer offers me $20,000, uh, I should consider not accepting that deal. Well, I am saying that. And I'm saying that because you may have heard the cliche sometimes, um, what, what's the cliche about too good to be true? Some things are too good to be true or something of that nature. Hmm. There may be certain catches in that $20,000 price point, which you should just consider. Okay. So you've set your price points. You should also then make or create what I call mile markers to assess where you are in the negotiation process. You're willing to pay $30,000 for the vehicle. And that dealer or salesperson tells you the best they can offer is $40,000. And if you can't come up with $40,000, they can't uh, come down. Well, okay. You need to know at what point you will walk away as opposed to saying, well, how about if I go to 32 or 33, or can you meet me at 35? Because again, if you have your plan in place, all you're doing then is executing your plan once you're actually in the negotiation process. And that will ease your mind to a great degree. Okay. So I totally get that I have been, I'm budgeting 30,000 for this vehicle and I'm not going to go a penny over and I could stick to that. Here's here's where where my psychology wants to trip me up is I might be able to get it for under 30, but I have to withhold information, right? Like I now have to play a game and that's already making me feel uncomfortable because I just want to be totally open and transparent and have everybody sing Kumbaya and hold hands. And I know that's not the way the world works, but if I'm, you know, if I say, well, 30 is my maximum, I'd love to get it for 24. Then then I've got a gray area where I, you could teach me the methodology. You know, there's like a 65, 85, 95, 100 thing. I forget who created that, but there's various ways of doing it. But underlying it all is this this feeling that may be triggered or uh, go along with imposter syndrome, like maybe I don't, I don't deserve to have my own secrets here. Well, Howie, there are several things you can do uh, to offset that thought process too. First of all, you have to question why you feel that way. And I'm saying anyone, why they feel a certain way uh, before entering into a negotiation. Seriously, because I tell people, my model is you're always negotiating, which means you're always negotiating with yourself also, all the time. Hmm. So if you truly feel that way, one thing you might consider doing or someone in such a situation might consider doing is having someone negotiate on their behalf, which is why clients have me negotiate on their behalf worldwide. They want another entity to either play good guy or bad guy to ferret out some of the um, strategies that the opposing uh, side might actually attempt to implement. The other aspect of that, Howie, if you know that you want to uh, pay 30000 for the vehicle and that's the maximum uh, price that you're willing to submit, you may tell the dealer and in negotiations, I tell people all things are fair, negotiation, love and war. And a lot of negotiators take that aspect. Uh, you may start off at 24,000. 25,000. You never really want to give the, the real mark at which you are willing to conclude a deal because 
some negotiators will take advantage of. If you tell them 30 and they were expecting 27 from you, they already know they have $3,000 more than they thought they'd get. And they may push the envelope to see if they can get you to go to 35. So you always leave yourself wiggle room in a negotiation from which to negotiate. That's number one. As I said a moment ago, you might also consider or someone in such a situation might consider having someone else negotiate for them. I've been in many a negotiations where the person that was either, I mean, either the team leader or the main negotiator had a proxy initially negotiating in that person's stead while that person was even in the environment. The person was in the environment, but had this other person sitting there as the proxy. Why? So that that leader could actually get the information and insight about what that opposing side would try and do as far as the strategies they'd implement. Once you see that, you, you've heard this. Uh, once you see that, you then know how to uh, make counter offers. You've heard many a times how a salesperson will say, well, let me go talk to my manager. <laughs> you know, it's a ploy yeah. that they're using. Uh, nine times out of 10, they don't really go talk to anyone. What they want you to do is to sit there and think and wonder and, and, and give the impression that they are really trying to pull uh, things towards your favor. In reality, as I said, they go back, they sit, they yada, yada, yada. Uh, and then they come back and they say, well, I have good news. My manager, my boss, my whatever said, um, I can't do, I can't do 30,000, but I can, um, I can come close. Now, if they don't give you a number, you don't want to say, well, can you do 32? That's something you just don't want to do because you've given them something that mm -hmm. they didn't ask, did not even ask for. Instead, you might want to say, well, how, how much better can you do? And they may come up and say, well, I can do 35. And you then can say, well, that's not good enough. Still not given a number. And notice the body language synchronization. That's not good enough. So body language plays a role in how we negotiate and to what degree we actually gather more insight about what it is that we are projecting and what it is that we are being perceived as projecting. Well, that's why I love talking to you about this, because I've, I've studied negotiation as a theory. And but if I'm saying, you know, but the body doesn't lie, right? So if I am still, if I haven't fixed my mindset, like for me, negotiation is a really good barometer of like my, my insides because every, everything comes out there. So if I'm, you know, and for people who are just listening to this, you should go on YouTube and, and watch the, the video because Greg is, is very consciously and intentionally moving his, his mouth and his face and <laughs> his, using his eyes and shoulders in certain ways. Um, th that, we, you know, I can't fake it by having all the techniques down because, you know, my body is going to betray my insecurities that, that can get taken advantage of. Well, uh, so, Howie, do you really want, well, you, let's use um, another individual's characteristics, okay, as opposed to saying you. But let's say someone had the characteristics that you mentioned a moment ago. And what would you suggest to that person they do in order to offset uh, the feeling of my insecurity is going to allow my my emotions to come through? What, what would you suggest to them? Yeah. Well, so I love the idea of a practice negotiation where you get to witness yourself and you get to see. So what are the things that they're saying that are beginning to trigger me? And every, from my perspective, everything starts mm -hmm. with the body. So if I'm paying attention in a low stakes situation where, you know, it's 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 pretend or it's a I'm negotiating, you know, a discount on a lamp for 30, you know, $40 discount instead of a $50,000 discount on a home or something, then I get to see where, where, you know, where does my body begin to want to take me? Where do I feel shame, which is I, I just want to get rid of? Where do I feel anger? And to be able to, you know, tune the in, play the instrument of my own body rather than getting played by it.
Ooh, I love that. Gosh, I got to write that quote down. I love it. <laughs> play the instrument. Instru- say that again. Play the instrument of my body as opposed to being played by it. I love that. <laughs> I yeah, love it for sure. <laughs> well, that's that's what it feels ah. like, right? When I'm when I'm in the, when I'm not paying attention, when I'm in the grip, like I can think back to times where I've lost my temper in ways that were deeply embarrassing. And it was always, it was never like me deciding, okay, this is, this is, I think the good, this is the right thing to say right here. (laughs) Right. It was always like the body went into a, an extreme fight or flight. And it was like, my brain had Mm -hmm. no choice. Mm -hmm. And because I wasn't willing to slow down, take a breath, excuse myself. I became, you know, the plaything of this, of this, um, fear-based mm-hmm. reaction. You, you know, you hit upon the word trigger several times, and it's something worth highlighting because everyone becomes triggered by some thoughts they've had about some occurrence that's happening to them right now, and or based on something that has happened in the past, they become triggered to commit or omit uh, certain types of action. And Knowing what can trigger you before you go into a negotiation is part of the planning process that one should engage in also, such that if that occurrence happens, instead of allowing it to trigger you towards something that is not beneficial towards your negotiation efforts, you instead calm yourself. You prepare yourself for that occurrence. And a lot of times when we're triggered, it's because our brain does not go into the thought process of making a safe, sound evaluation of how we want to respond to a certain thing. And that's why we just act. And then we think later and it's like, oh gosh, I don't believe I did that type of thing. But triggering and thinking about what might trigger you is an aspect that occurs that should occur when you're in the planning stages of the negotiation. And during the mock negotiation, you can actually have that individual that you are practicing with set triggers off in you such that you become prepared for them. That will also allow you to become a lot calmer during the negotiation because it's you expect it to happen, to occur. And if it doesn't happen, okay, so what? It didn't happen, but it didn't affect the negotiation negatively for you either. Mm. Well, the way the way you're talking about it, it almost feels like negotiation is like a path towards like enlightenment. Mm-hmm. Like I could sit and meditate like all day long and just, you know, become one with the universe. But as soon as someone steps on my toe, I'm like, you <laughs> asshole. <laughs> right. <laughs> Whereas like this is taking like, you know, taking myself into the real mm-hmm. world. And saying like, am you know, because all triggers are basically fear yes, triggers. Yes. Like some something feels like a threat, and you're saying like, the more the more you can be out in the world and not see, because these aren't real threats. This isn't someone holding a gun to your head. This isn't someone you know trying to drown you underwater. These are psychological constructs that you're putting on a situation. And so to 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 me, enlightenment might be seeing things as they really are. And and therefore, going through like ex, extirpating your fears and false assumptions through this process. I, oh, well, I tell you what, you just gave me another quote. <laughs> Negotiation is a path to enlightenment, and I, I love that too for <laughs> sure. Because you may have heard the cliche that fear is the false expectation appearing real, and a lot of times hmm. we do have this perspective of why we are fearful of something, and it's based on what we've experienced in the past. Well, in reality, our mind does not know the difference between reality and that which is not reality. When we are asleep and we have dreams, what we dream feels as though it is our reality in the moment. And then we wake up and find out, oh, no, 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 that was just a dream. Well, What would happen if we, before entering into a negotiation, we put ourselves into a frame of mind that stated whatever would serve us, what was beneficial to our negotiation efforts. If we put ourselves in that state of mind before entering into the negotiation, that becomes real. That becomes our reality. And I suggest then to that, Mm. if by chance one does not feel as though one is less than 
one is going to experience these these gut feelings uh, based on a particular action that might occur in the negotiation. One is prepared for it. <clears throat> Excuse me. One is prepared for it, and then one can actually adjust better in the negotiation because one has allayed those potential fears and allowed them not to rise up to the point of creating inaction or the wrong action in them. Mm. So I'm, as I hear that, I'm thinking back to one of my worst ever negotiations, which was, I want to say, 15, 16 years ago, something like that, probably a little bit more than that. And it was someone I'd attended a conference and someone gave a talk about, you know, it was a business building conference and he had a he had a system for sale for 5000 bucks. You'd get his binders and he was going to teach you how to do the thing. And I got, you know, I got excited in the heat of the moment and I went and I bought it. and I paid, put down a fifteen hundred dollar deposit. A couple of weeks later, I get the binders and I'm like, you know what? This is not really for me. And so I called him up and said, I, this isn't for me. I think I'd like to send them back and get a refund. And he said, well, you know, I think you're the kind of guy who honors his commitments, aren't you? And I'm like, yes, I am. And it ended up like he somehow I, I felt so slimed afterwards. But in the moment, like the only thing that mattered to me was getting his mm. approval. And I feel like he took advantage. He was a very soft spoken, sweet seeming guy. But I was in the I was in the tank with a shark. And he was, you know, and he, the shark was wearing a Mother <laughs> Teresa mask. So I did not realize it. But he played on he was very good at, at, at sensing my weakness. And, you know, you've written negotiating with the bully. And that's not typically how we think of bullies acting. But I looking back now, I felt I feel totally mm. bullied by this person preying on my need for him to think I was a good person. Yeah, well, first of all, there are several factors that were at play there. If you felt strongly enough about having those binders returned, you may have considered ignoring his statements altogether. You and no, no, no not you. We only allow things to happen to us that we wish to happen to us. OK, and I say that simply to say we are in control of our own environment. Worst case scenario, you could have said to him or one might have said to him, you know, I appreciate your perspective. Can you please tell me where I'm sending these binders or how I'm to return these binders? He I don't know him. I don't know uh, to what degree he may have been trying to use negotiation employees. But you mentioned the fact that the soft spokenness that he projected, that's a way to disarm people also. Well, and you'd said he started off with yeah. the question, uh, something like you are a person that uh, abides by your agreements, right? Uh, he was setting you up right at that point. It's like, well, of course I am, <laughs> you know, yeah. type of thing. Um, and you, you might have from a negotiation perspective, said, well, yes, that's true. And then went right back to your position. Uh, and can you tell me where I can send these binders uh, to get a refund? Or can you tell me the process to get a refund? Uh -huh. So just don't yeah, go, don't oh, take the bait. Exactly, because I was getting ready to go with the shark analogy that you mentioned, mentioned a moment ago. Don't <laughs> even become shark bait at all. Don't become shark bait. Uh -huh. Again, <laughs> before you enter into a negotiation, you know what the outcome is that you're seeking. You assess what might occur that may disrupt the flow of the negotiation that may prevent you from reaching your end goal and how you're going to come about obtaining that goal if those disruptions do occur. So with him saying, again, uh, well, you're the type of person that abides by your agreement. In theory, some people may have said, well, can you tell me how I can uh, uh, return this, these products? Not even addressing the statement that he made, just jump right over it, you know? Yeah. Uh, but it takes a certain type of negotiation um, demeanor to actually project what is needed to reach the goal.
Right. And then for me, it would have like at that point in my life, I was not nearly as self-aware as I am now about, you know, a coping mechanism that I have is to be the help is to be the one approved of. Mm. Right. For that, like like for me to feel safe has typically traditionally required everyone to like me. Right. So to understanding that I can then see, oh, this mm -hmm. is what's happening. I'm getting this feeling in my body that means I'm in danger of not being liked. Now mm -hmm. I get to choose what mm -hmm. to do with that. Well, how are you? Right. So I might, you know, I might say back. Absolutely. And you're the sort of person who all who only wants to do a fair deal where you're getting paid for the value. That, you provide, that is right? one perspective from which you could actually uh, offer right. a rebuttal. How about this? You learn from that lesson, as you just stated a moment ago. If you if one had the type of background that you spoke of and they put themselves into different negotiation scenarios from which they could continuously build this new persona that they wanted to project over an extended period of time, they would become different in different negotiations. And that's another reason why I tell people my motto is you're always negotiating. And as I said earlier, even with yourself, you have to have that proper mindset that says I will go after my goal. Now, do I compromise? Of course, I will compromise. To what degree then becomes the question. And if you practice negotiations by just observing how you engage throughout your day, you will observe how you're negotiating with people, how you're interacting with other individuals and what type of strategies you're using, because we constantly use negotiation strategies throughout our whole day. Someone says, how's your day? Well, they're asking about your experiences to that point. You choose to say good, bad. Well, let me tell you what happened to me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which then shapes ever so slightly their perspective of you. And, and okay, so somebody says, how's your day? Yeah, are they interested? Are they not interested? What body language gestures goes along with that? We take all of that in and it then impacts how we interact with individuals after that occurrence. So we have to be mindful of how we are actually going through our day, even from a negotiation uh, perspective. And the fact that you're always negotiating, what you do today in this moment impacts the next particular moment, the next day, the day after that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because we're constantly building upon a foundation that we create from whatever point we want to recognize such occurring. Mm. So what comes to me there is a little concern about am I when do I get to be authentically me if I'm always projecting a, an air in which I'm trying to achieve Are you outcomes? authentic when you have a dream? I is the dream real? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, so you're being authentic when you're dreaming. The dream is not real. Uh, wait a minute now. No, it's not an oxymoron. The point is, reality is what you choose to make it. And authenticity is what you choose it to be when you choose it to be. You we all change our personalities, our personas change constantly. That does not necessarily have to mean that we're not being authentic. Again, it's the perspective that we have of ourselves based on the environment in which we find ourselves that we project certain personas. And there are many different facets of individuals that show themselves in different traits that we choose to exhibit based on the environment that we're in. And so we always had to be mindful. I, I, I consider myself to be authentic 100% of the time because it's who I am at that moment. And like you said a moment ago, dreams aren't real, but you're authentic in that dream. I always attempt to be very honest, open, and truthful. I'm accepting of all people. I'm willing to listen to someone's views and perspectives such that I can understand them better. Now, I may not agree with everyone, mm. but I'm still being authentic because I am who I am 
And the person I am to myself is the person that I project to others. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So that, that with the way I was thinking about authenticity is almost could be seen as a form of indulgence where I'm just going to let my emotions run me and think of that as authentic, as opposed to like, I, if you asked me how my day went today, I could e I could equally truthfully say it's been great and it's been kind of bad. And both of those could be true. But like the question is like, which who do I For want sure. to be? Let me tell I'm sorry. And well, let me tell you something else that I just ahead. observed when you did that. And here's where body language comes into play. You said I could truly say the day was good. You you actually did that. Uh, <laughs> and then you said, or I could say I? it was bad. Now the shoulder hunch is usually a situation. It can be, first of all, from a body language perspective, never take one gesture as the meaning for the total being. You always look at a cluster of gestures to assess what's really occurring in someone's mind. So when you did like that and stated something in the positive and this was like, ah, shrugging it off type of thing, it was listen to the mindset that he's displaying right now. Listen to the mindset that he's displaying, mm. meaning I'm watching what you're saying. And there was a, a momentary conflict with the actions of the body and the words. Nevertheless, you were still showing clarity about the mindset that you had at that particular moment. Right then, you were showing the clarity that you had, which was authentic. And, and that's what I'm suggesting, that we realize we are who we are at that moment. You and I are both members of 100 Coaches, and Marshall Goldsmith, who founded 100 Coaches, talks about living in the moment. And correct me if I misquote this or misstate this, but he also says... Uh, in Buddhism, every moment is a new beginning or something of that nature. Did I get that right? Yeah, I think we could, we, we, we ah, reincarnate there you go. with every there, breath. There you go. Exactly. Like so were we authentic a moment ago? Are we authentic now? Oh, another moment has passed. Are we now authentic? I would suggest we are simply because we are who we are at that particular moment. That is us. Who we wish to be is something that we can shape ourselves into becoming, at the same time, respect who we are in that moment because that is our true selves that we are displaying. If to nobody else, we're doing it to ourselves, for ourselves, for our well-being. That's my perspective. <laughs> hmm. Gotcha. So, so, so worrying about authenticity is ah, a little bit of a red herring. I would suggest yes. And, and I'm glad you mentioned red herrings. Because a lot of times we create these red herrings to make ourselves feel better or to serve as a trigger towards something that we want to move towards or away from. But the fact is we have to be we have to recognize exactly what we're doing to ourselves in our mind, because that's not our reality at that particular point in time. If it is truly a red herring, it's something that we're placing in front of ourselves for a specific reason. It would behoove us to understand what that reasoning is if we did a self-analysis to dig deeper into our psyche such that we understand what is really motivating us at that moment in time and why is it doing so at that moment in time is what we would question. Well, you said twice now that we're always you know, negotiating with ourselves. And so if I'm negotiating with somebody else, my job is to learn as much about their motivation as possible. Like the more they talk, the more I learn. But I don't do that with myself. I just try I just try to win. Right. I don't <laughs> like it. Would be, like it might be a useful negotiation tool to find out if I'm negotiating with myself. Who am I talking to? What do they want? What are their fears? What are their desires? What 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 makes them tick? And that's that's like another beautiful well, spiritual. Let question, me suggest. It? Yes, it is a very beautiful spiritual question. Let me suggest that we do the self evaluation at our subconscious level. We're not sometimes aware of it, but we are. Uh, okay, so hmm, how am I going to act in a particular situation? Before I walk into it, is something that we think of at a 
conscious level, or we should anyway, uh, but we've already started making those assessments before it even surfaces to our state of consciousness. So to the degree that we understand ourselves, we understand, we can place ourselves in a position to understand others better because some people may not have the same perspective that we have about a particular situation. And we need to make sure that we understand why we have the perspective, first of all, because in so doing, we then place ourselves in a position to better open ourselves to whatever thoughts they have. That doesn't mean we have to accept all of their thoughts and opinions and embrace them as our own. But at the same time, it allows us to be more mindful of the mindset that we are engaging ourselves in before we even engage with those individuals. Hmm. So what, what comes to me is that you've written a lot about how to negotiate with a bully. And it feels like what you're telling us to do is to be the opposite of a bully, which to me is someone who knows themselves, who is in touch with their own humanity and therefore is sensitive enough to see other people's humanity. Seeing that that's that's actually more powerful. That if when you can do that, there's no need for bullying. True. And at the same time, I'm going to flip that coin because seriously speaking, okay. everyone that you will negotiate with will not have your best interest at heart. And when you are confronted with that type of individual, a real bullying type, you need to engage that person from their perspective. They're looking at you as a lamb. And if you allow them, they'll take you to slaughter. You do not wish that to occur. So you would actually combat them. And that's why negotiations can become messy at times. But again, no, in this case, the foe against whom you are negotiating, know what type of bullying tactics they may use, what type of uh, procedures and strategies they may attempt to employ in order to finesse you, if not just outright bully you into a certain position. And then you adopt a stance such that you can let them know, I'm not one to be bullied, even though you have a kind heart, even though you have a gentle persona. If you know you have that gentle persona and you're going to be going up against a bully, harden your core. You don't want to show that bully weakness because that bully uh, will take weakness as a sign from which to attack you even more ferociously. And you don't want that to happen at all. So you adopt the persona based on the negotiation that you're entering into. I always take the perspective of win-win. I want to make sure the person with whom I'm negotiating feels as though he or she got the best deal that they could have gotten as a result of the interactions that we had. I do not attempt to browbeat someone into submission in order to gain more from the negotiation than I would otherwise be willing to give. But <laughs> if you're negotiating with a true bully, you know, it's like I take the gloves off. And I've come to learn how to do that as a result of negotiating in many different environments over many, many years. And that's why I said I suggested that people should take note of how they negotiate in different environments with whom they negotiate and the outcomes that they receive as a result of what occurred in those negotiations. Over a period of time, you will enhance your skills. Mm. So what's coming to mind is a, a book that I'm in the middle of. It's a book on relationships called Us by Terry Reel, who's a, 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 I guess a, a relationship therapist. And he, he encourages all of his clients and the readers of the book mm. to take a no contempt pledge, like contempt free living, which means you catch yourself. You do not express contempt or disrespect to any human being. And he says the flip, the, the other side of that is uh -huh. you don't accept it from people. Right. That you if you, you say like this is not how I want to be talked to and you do the best you can to get, you know, to. Mm -hmm. change the situation or get out of it. But you don't like when you are being browbeaten by a bully, you're complicit in the creation of contempt. So true. That is. So, and that's why you have to rebuke that bully because uh, my goodness, why team up with the bully against yourself? 
<laughs> you know, it's like, oh, you want to bully me? Let me help you. <laughs> no, you really have to set your groundwork such that you plant your feet and you let the bully know, hey, I'm not going to be dealt with in that particular manner. And the bully says, oh, well, what are you going to do about it? Well, you should be prepared, like you said a moment ago, to excavate, excavate yourself from that environment such that you don't stand there if you're not willing to confront the bully. And you don't have to physically confront that bully. I spoke about leverage earlier. There are ways to use leverage to offset the tactics that a bully would even engage with you. You have to understand the bully's mind. Why is that individual trying to bully you is something that I would suggest you delve into because if you understand that bully's being motivated by the fact that he, she wants to show others how tough they can be in a particular situation. Uh, he, she wants to set the groundwork whereby in future negotiations, they can maneuver you any kind of way that they wish to do so. Understand that mindset. And one way to ask in certain situations is to simply come out and say, uh, you know, I feel like you're, you're kind of trying to bully me right now. You can either then say, is that true? Or just leave it right there and see what type of feedback you get. Because in some cases, some people will actually say, oh, I'm sorry, that was not my intent. Uh, and words are one thing, actions are another. Then watch how they modify their actions after that. If they say, oh, that was not my intention, and then they continue with their bullying tactics, you can then try and assure them one more time, well, you know, I'm still getting that feeling. Now, there's something else you should note. They may say, why do you have those feelings? That's someone that could be displaying concern about how you are feeling per their actions. And that's altogether different ever so slightly from the person that says, oh, that's not my intent. The person that goes that step further and says, um, well, exactly what am I doing that's making you feel that way? Maybe, and I say maybe because boy, oh boy, oh boy, Howie, I've negotiated with some negotiators that are extremely tough, especially those in uh, governments uh, throughout the world, uh, C-level people and corporations throughout the world, and they will use a ploy like that to even suck you in deeper. But you then watch what they do after that, after that, after that, after that, and you can then start to build um, a stream of steps that they're engaging in per their real intent. If you feel as though you do not wish to be in that environment, exit it. Never place yourself in an environment from a negotiation perspective where you feel as though you have to stay engaged simply because you want whatever outcome is being offered to you. A bully will then just drag you through all kinds of muck and make you feel slimy and so forth and so on. And in the end, you're like, oh, I got the deal I want or I wanted but you won't feel good about yourself. And to thine self, I say, always be true. Mm. That's beautiful. And the, the, the other thing that's coming up for me is I think I've had a perspective that me trying to get what I want and trying hard to get what I want is mm. somehow disrespectful to others. But I think that's not true. And I was, I was recently um, reading a book by Bill McKibben, who's an environmental activist who, who, was, who was talking about, um, you know, what we can do, like given, given climate crisis and everything, like what, what, where is there hope? And he was talking about an, a, um, an initiative to bring solar cells, solar power to very rural communities in sub-Saharan Africa. And he was talking about he, he went on some sales visits with some of the, the top and salespeople and some of the people who are trying to learn how to do sales. And, you know, they're ta they're trying to get someone to put a, a, a cell on their roof mm -hmm. who makes, you know, eight dollars a month, you know, and they're going in hard. They're do they're going in They're They're like, this is how much you'll get. And wouldn't your wife like it? You know, imagine everyone coming to watch the TV in your house and status and all these things that I th I've thought of in terms of like sleazy sales tactics. And what the author was saying was 
Like these are people who are used to NGOs, government officials, nonprofits coming in and just telling them what to do and doing things for them. And here was someone trying his hardest to make a sale. And the, they were able to mm. feel the dignity of being able to say no, of being able to withstand all that and feeling like, like even when they said no, like they felt good mm -hmm. about themselves. Like I'm the one with the power here. And then two weeks later, they would inevitably come back because it was a really good deal objectively and they would could do it on layaway and it was clear that they were going to benefit from it. But even the ones who said yes, said no first as a means of mm -hmm. um, expl exclaiming their dignity. And so I'm starting to think like me negotiating hard is actually respectful rather than disrespectful. Oh, oh, it definitely is. It definitely is. And, and let me just talk about something that you just mentioned a moment ago, and it is power. The perception of power lies in the individual that assumes he or she has it. I was, uh, I did an interview, um, oh gosh, earlier this week, and someone asked me who has power in a negotiation. And my answer was, and will always be the person that thinks they have it. <laughs> but I mean, if I think I have power in a negotiation, I have it. I could literally be, if I'm looking at uh, a 50-50 uh, outcome, I could be in the other person's mind at a 90-10 in favor of that individual. But if I think I'm at 50-50, I think I have that power to do whatever I think I want to do in the negotiation. So the point is, if you think you have power, you do, and you will tend to negotiate more stringently if you have that perceived perception of power, as opposed to if you think you don't. And by allowing someone to feel as though they are in a power position during a negotiation, you embolden them. And Howie, here's the other thing. When people feel emboldened, they will also feel as though they can control the flow of the negotiation. Now, truth be known, that's yet another tactic in negotiations also, to allow people to feel comfortable enough to say yes, no to a deal. And they feel empowered. And with that power, they may embrace more of what it is that you are offering simply because you're not browbeating them with, oh, well, you know, well, hey, if you have to do this, you can do that, you can do this, that, 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 but you have to. You give them the power and you gain power in return. Hmm. That's that's quite beautiful. What, what's what's coming up for me right now is um, I'm watching an HBO series called Irma Vep, which is about a uh, an A list American actor, a woman who plays like plays the super Marvel superheroes, is in Paris making this um, sort of you know small indie film, and there's a scene where her her assistant, um, her ex assistant who used to be her lover, uh, they meet. And so, you know, one of them is this, you know, infinitely wealthy, powerful Hollywood superstar, and the other is her assistant. And yet the assistant in this interaction has all the power. Mm. She's like, you know, you sit down, turn this way. Right. Like, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, it gets a little bit sort of creepy and submissive, but cl like clearly it drives the point. Like objectively, if you looked at these two and, and said, who has the power? The employer who is honored by the world and extremely wealthy has the power. But in the actuality of the negotiation of their relationship, she's the submissive one. That happens a lot of times also. And uh, sometimes it occurs and people are not even uh, aware that they are in such a dynamic environment whereby, again, it goes back to the mindset that I said, if you think you have power, you have power. If you don't, you don't. And sometimes you can be submissive to power in order to gain more power. Uh, so th there are all kinds of aspects that one should be aware of that occurs in a negotiation such that one can negotiate more effectively and reach greater outcomes for all parties concerned. Mm. I think we'll, well, let's end there. We're almost at, at, at an hour. So... Oh, wow. uh, <laughs> I've oh, taken wow. up as much of your time as 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 I said I would, but uh, 
Thank you. This has been this has been so delightful. And every every conversation I have with you, I just I feel like I'm I, I'm doing like inner laundry. I'm like <laughs> pulling out dirty garments, washing them, hanging them up to dry, looking at them, and and just understanding myself and the world better. So I, I so appreciate you and what you do. Well, and, and you know what, Howie? Let me tell you something. I appreciate you from several perspectives, and I've said this to you before. You have a kind generous giving heart and it does come across as being very authentic and i spoke about how people change from one moment to the other based on the situation that they're in now i'm able to observe body language too to also assess to what degree somebody is being honest authentic yada 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 you just come across that way period and point blank which is why i said anytime i could help you i would always be willing to do so and here's the other aspect that I have not told you before. Howie, I was you at one particular point in my life. I, I truly was. And the thing is, I, mean, I grew up, are we still recording? We are still recording. Can we, I, I'm happy to keep going because this, this is getting juicy. Oh, okay. Do you, do you want to stop? Do you want to stop well, recording? Um, I'll tell you what, if this comes across as too open, maybe you can edit it out. But I grew up in a that I, I I don't. There's no such thing for oh, okay, me. So you okay. you you just if you want me to turn off the recording, I can. If you want if you want to. Okay. Well, let's let's end, the, let's, end the, let's end the recording here, and then I'll. All right, boy. People are going to be wondering. Oh, what we're okay, okay. Never about mind. Let, let it go. Let it go. I'll just say this then, and yeah. then we'll stop. I grew up in a very um, impoverished environment, and I grew up in one where bullies were extremely prominent in all the environments I grew up in. Um, by the time I was 13 years old, uh, my family had moved to 13 different locations within probably a two or three mile radius of where we first started uh, when we when I was. Uh -huh. And where, where was this? Was Philadelphia. As a matter of fact. So you were in North yeah, Philly? There you go, North Philly. I was going to say, if you went to uh, where I was a kid growing up, you wouldn't be able to see anything. I went to Temple. That's, and that's where Temple is. That's right. Temple has taken up all of that yeah. space uh, now. Um, yeah. But what I was going to say was growing up in that environment uh, allowed me to learn some coping techniques. And one of the coping techniques I uh, learned was not only how to negotiate better because I was a small, thin, and skinny kid also. So the other kids would bully me take my money. Sometimes they beat me up, to be quite frank with you. And I learned coping techniques to try to avoid them, number one, try to avoid bullies. And then later, talking about leverage, I'd have three or four of my friends that I'd walk with. <laughs> and that would just be mm. like, oh, that's a larger mass. The bully's not going to attack me because I'm within a larger mass right now. And I simply say that to say, you being so authentic and open and honest, I naturally migrate towards you and people of your ilk simply because I was once that way and I have a special place in my heart for people like that. I, I, I know you're the type of individual that I could enter into a deal with, not try to browbeat you, offer you the best deal by telling you, honestly, hey, Howie, you know what? Hey, this is the best I could do. And I know that you would not try to take advantage of me and thus, I would feel no need to have a shield with me. I'd completely bear my soul to you knowing, hey, this guy is going to be as honest with me as I am with him. And the more honest we are with one another, the faster we'll reach a deal. And the more likely it will be that it will stay, stay together. The deal will uh, stay together, will consummate whatever mm -hmm. the covenants of the deal are. And I just say all of that to simply say, I love your personality type. You're a wholesome individual. You add value to the world, and it's value that's truly needed for who you are, Howie. Yes, in a negotiation, based on the outcomes you want, okay, change your demeanor. Other than that, Howie. Yeah, or or, or just get someone like you to do it for me, to be part of my posse. There you go, and I'm always willing to be part of your posse, for sure, because of who you are. <laughs> uh, other than that, my gosh, don't change a thing. I mean, let others emulate who you are, because man, oh man, oh man, you're really the salt of the earth for sure, my friend. Well, thank you. I'm just I'm going to take that in and uh, let it let it water my soul. Uh, I really ooh, appreciate else. those water words. Water my soul. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, 
this, it's, I'm already thinking about the next conversation I want to have mm -hmm. with you, which I'll, I'll just, um, I'll sort of precede it a little bit and say, it's, it's about um, the legacies that we come from growing up. So you talk about, you know, North Philly, skinny, poor, also mm -hmm. black. And the potential, like when you said you have exactly as much power as you mm -hmm. think you do, right? Like in our society, there are plenty of places in which you and I are assumed to have different degrees of power just because of the color of our skin. And I'm real curious. Let's not do it now because it's going to it's going to be another <laughs> hour. But like what what is the way, you know, how do you how do you want white men to be allies in a world in which I'm also trying to win? Ooh. Okay, this is going to be a great teaser right. for this coming attraction, as so, it were, and it is. So, if you're if you're willing to oh, have that conversation, so. and, I'm and looking you forward. know, just the answer, and then we'll talk about how. The answer is show them the benefits of doing so. There's the teaser. Hmm. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll hit you up in about a month if that's, that's all right. More than all right, definitely so, definitely so, Howie. Right. Okay, take care, my friend, and thank you All for right. the invitation, and thank you for who you are. Well, and thank you for who you are, and what you do, and what you what you are going to what you're helping me to do. You're so more than I, welcome. I appreciate it very okay. much. Take care, Howie. Okay, care, bye bye. Oh wait, wait, yes, wait, wait, wait! Yes. Where can people find you? Oh, you know what? Ah, I said I to myself, forgot. no, no, no. Let me tell you, that's interesting because I said to myself, I don't want this to turn into a promo type of thing, but. Yeah, you're right. Marshall says, if people don't know how to get a hold of you or you don't put yourself out there, you're not serving them. They can reach me at greg, G-R-E-G, at themasternegotiator.com. They can also go to my website, and I have tons of free stuff there at the, T-H-E, master, M-A-S-T-E-R, negotiator, N-E-G-O-T-I-A-T-O-R.com. And again, please... For anyone seeing this, go to my website. Just take all the free stuff that you can find there such that you can become a better negotiator and learning and learn how to read body language in the process. And hey, I want to give as much as I possibly can to others such that others can give to those that they care about too. And this is the way we can do so. Thank you for that, Howie. Awesome. Yeah, I'm sorry, I almost forgot, but I'm glad because people who are listening to this are going to want okay, what you have. Okay. And so uh, themasternegotiator.com, you can find yeah. it all there. So Greg, thanks again. It's it's so wonderful to have you in my life. And I look forward to many more conversations. Thank you, Howie, and we will for sure. Take care, my friend.